but you don't have to take notes or anything. I'd rather you engage with what I'm telling you about. Oh, wow. And uh, then I'll put the video on YouTube when we're all done and send the link around. So, um, That's awesome. I've got uh, pictures that I took back on, I think it was November 2nd, a couple years ago. Uh, downtown Detroit, all the pictures were taken on this day. And there were five of them that I used, all except for this one here and this one, which is the final result. And those, um, those are what created that final result that's hanging in the library. So that's what you wanted me to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. And the goal of what I'm going to do here mm -hmm. is that uh, I'm going to take the remaining pictures, one, two, three, and four, and I'm going to make this out of them. And then this is going to be applied on top of the, the street photo to make the final result. Um, so I'm going to start by taking the original raw photo completely undeveloped and go into the develop module to show you what I did to it. Um, I always start my development by pushing the auto button and then I go from there. And right away, if I zoom in, you'll see I screwed this picture up royally. There's nothing in focus in the whole picture. And I liked the picture though. I liked the, the composition pretty much. I liked what it showed. I thought it was nice and busy and everything. So I wanted to do something with it. So I just got the idea that I, if I throw a ton of shit on top of here, nobody will ever be able to tell that it's out of focus. And it worked. Um, so my develop settings were automatic. And at this point, I, I don't have a quality picture, so I can do whatever I want here. I can throw dehaze way up and uh, try to get a little bit of detail back in this picture. And um, I pulled the vibrance up quite a bit. Um, and of course I cropped it because this lower left corner is not at all interesting. The way I chose to crop, I could have cropped so that uh, this walk sign was in the photo in the fire hydrant, but I actually took it to the telephone pole right here at the left edge and everything else was just fine. I like this half person being here, so I left everything else alone there. Um, and then the last thing I did was a, a little bit of sharpening to try to get uh, uh, some more detail back in. So let me go to the sharpening and show you how I do that. I always pull sharpening all the way up and then I set my radius. I, uh, I pull it all the way to the right, I pull it all the way to the left, and I compare those and say what do I want to accomplish in this particular picture. And in this picture I need all the sharpness that I can get so I left it all the way to the right. I do the same thing with detail. I pull it all the way to the right. This just crunches everything up, so I don't like it for this particular image. I go all the way to the left, and I find something in between that accomplishes what I want to accomplish with it. Then I pull my amount down, because this is, this is too much sharpening for what I want to accomplish with this. I pull down the amount to the amount that makes sense for that image, and then I'll usually hold down the Alt key. You can see that I'm pressing the Alt key down here. That's where my keystrokes will show in the video. Um, and I pull the masking slider. And what that does is shows you which things are going to be sharpened. And I don't really care that any of the surfaces on the cars are sharpened. There's nothing there to begin with. So there's no sense crunching up my image by sharpening those surfaces. I just want to sharp edges. And so I move this masking slider pretty far to the right, usually, so that it's only sharpening edges. And that's how I'll do sharpening, typically. So that's the photo that I'm going to start with. And uh, I'm also going to be, let's go back to grid view. I'm also going to be control clicking the other three, the other four images that I'm going to use. And then I'm going to right click on the image that I want to have as the name of my final photo. I want that to be the first one that I clicked, so it's the brighter white selected one, and also it's the one that I want to right click on and say edit in Photoshop as layers. And that way when it comes back into Lightroom, DSC 02058 is going to be the main part of the name. So uh, while that's opening in Photoshop, while it's opening in Photoshop, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I'm going to do in Photoshop. This is called a non-destructive workflow that I'm going to use. Nothing that I do in the demonstration here in making this composite photo is anything that can't be gone back and changed later. There's no flattening of the image. There's no um, 
effects that are applied directly to the image, I do everything with layers. And the reason I do that is because then I can go back in and modify things. When I actually made this picture, um, it probably took me two weeks of three or four hour per day sessions at night getting the look that I wanted out of everything. I didn't just have it in my head how I was going to accomplish anything. So I had to use this kind of workflow, otherwise I'd be doing the whole thing over and over and over again 50 times before I got a decent result. If you use the kind of workflow that I'm going to show you here, you can go back and make changes very easily. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is um, rearrange the photos because I want that, uh, let's uh, alt click the eye on this one. This is my base layer. This is the one that I'm going to lay stuff on top of. And while I'm here with only this one selected, I'm going to hit Control T to transform, and I'm going to make it be the same size as all my other images. Remember, we cropped it so it came in smaller. And then if I Alt click the eye again, it'll make all my layers visible again. And I can see from the thumbnail that this one is also undersized. That was actually created by um, using an upright transform on this photo and then uh, cropping it so that um, you know how the edges go all wonky when you do an upright transform and then changing it to black and white. Uh -huh. So this was the layer that I that I ended up with and I'm gonna transform that again with control T. Oops, gotta select the layer first. Um, control T to transform the layer and make it the same size. So now all five of the images are the same size and uh, I'm just, oh, okay, I wanted this one on the bottom, then I wanted 1909, so that's this one. Then I wanted uh, 2083, which it's already there, and then 1950, okay, that's already there, and then 1909, copy one. Oh, I've got those backwards. 1909, copy one there, and 1909, original down here. Okay. So now I'm just going to turn off the top two layers. I guess I could turn off this one too, but it's not going to show through anyhow. But now you see that I'm working with these two layers. And I'm going to play with blend modes. Mm -hmm. And the way I normally do this is just by pulling down the blend mode and hovering over each one and looking what's, what looks cool, what gives me an effect that I want. And the effect that I want here is to make something that's totally unrecognizable. It's got city type themes inside it. It's maybe something that I can turn into something that looks like I'm looking through a broken glass window, something like that, and that's what I'm going to overlay on top of the image. So for this, I found that divide worked best, and I pulled the opacity down to 60%. Um, now, like I said, this stuff didn't just come to me. I look at this image and I say divide 60% is what's going to be right. I played with this for a long time to try to get things right. And I'll show you how you can do that without losing any of your prior work and with only modifying a couple of, you know, the couple of things that you want to modify. And the key to it is making all of the adjustments in adjustment layers. So I'm going to move on to my next layer. On this one I used pin light with an opa opacity, and actually I, uh, I did a transform on this. Let me do that first. Um, oh, I changed my uh, blend mode there. That's divide. This one is pin light. Uh, but first I'm going to do my uh, transform on it. Um, I didn't want to use this uh, square looking image. I'm going to use control minus to zoom out. I didn't want, want these lines to be squared up. I wanted them to be at an angle. I had played around and found that that was the way that uh, was going to give me what I wanted. Oh, this is the way I rotated it. So that this went from the upper right corner to the lower left corner was how I found it worked best. Something like that, a little bit smaller, I think, and pull it down a little bit. Something like that was what I used. So I hit enter, and then I found that pin light was the best thing for uh, the best uh, blending mode for this, and that is down here. And the opacity I used was 63%. By the way, I failed to mention, uh, if you've got questions that occur to you, just blurt them out. I'd, I have no problem getting questions in the middle of the, the uh, presentation. Uh, and then I go up to my next layer. 
This I really only used because everything is now offset toward the, oh, let me hit control zero to zoom back in. All of the interesting stuff is on the right hand side. I need something on the upper left corner to balance all of this and to make crazy stuff up there too. So that's why I added this layer into the whole mix. And for this layer, I used the subtract blend mode. And I pulled the opacity way down again to 60. And on this one, I also pulled the fill down to 30% or 35%. So I've got something that is the base for what I used, but it doesn't quite look like what I ended up using. This was what I ended up use or what I ended up coming up with to over overlay that image. So to get to that point, I added brightness and contrast layer on top of all of this to make it uh, um, less bright and a lot more contrast. I went down to minus 30 and up to 100 contrast. And then the really important part was a color lookup table to change it to a purplish hue and the, the more of an edgy type color. I use color lookups a lot. And uh, the particular lookup that I used here was late sunset. And again, I just go over all of them. Uh, I thought that it would preview those. I guess you've got to actually pick them. Uh, and now I'm using the arrow key to just move from one to the next to the next. What I ended up using was uh, late sunset. And I used a multiply blend mode on it. And then the opacity was down to 60% on this layer. And now you can see that that's pretty close to what I actually used. Could use a little bit more brightness, it looks like, but uh, oh my gosh. that's where I, where I came up with that. We'll brighten it up just a little bit. OK, so now I'm going to change this overlay stuff that I'm going to be doing on top of my base image. I'm going to select one of the layers. I'm going to shift select the top layer because I'm going to group them by pushing down control G. Now they're just a single group and they can be manipulated as, as a whole. For example, setting the blend mode. Now I'm blending, I'm setting the blend mode for that entire composite thing. Uh, and I used linear light on this. Linear light. Yeah, go back. How did you how did you take your four pictures and make them into one group? Go back. I, I... Sure. I'm going to hit Control Z to undo. Uh, okay, you yeah. can. One way to do it is is to. Uh, you know what? Let me move this divider so we can see all my layers. The easiest way to do it is to select the topmost layer that you want to group, then Shift select the bottommost layer so that they're all selected. I assume you could also Control select all of them individually and then I hold down control and G now I'm using keyboard shortcuts but I'm sure that there's something up here in the menus or on the context menus that says create group so it was con control G does that answer it yeah that's good okay um, so the blend mode that I wanted on my group was uh, linear light I'm going to make that bottom layer visible now. Uh, the opacity on my group was 70. And now there's a little bit of magic. I don't know if you guys have used layer uh, blending options, I mean. Uh, you double click on the right side of the layer that you want to add blending options to. And you get this dialog here. And the things that are important to me here are this layer and underlying layer. What these do is say that um, if, if I pull this slider to the left, then things that are bright in this layer will not be blended into the underlying image. So anything that's any of these colors up here in this layer won't be blended into the underlying layer. Similarly, if I was to move this slider, then anything dark in this layer would not be blended into the underlying layer. And then the other thing is you can specify the blending based on the underlying layer. If the underlying layer is dark at a particular pixel, then 
this layer won't be blended on top of it. Or if the underlying layer is bright at a certain pixel, then this layer won't be blended into it. You can see that the sky is disappearing now because the underlying layer is bright in the sky, and so all the blending is taken away from, this, from what this layer does. And the settings that I found worked well for this uh, particular image was to change this layer up to 27. And now the magic here, or another piece of magic here, is to hold down the Alt key and click on that, that slider, and it splits the slider apart so that you get a gradual um, transition at that point. Anything between 25 and 82 is gradually transitioned in the image, and then everything beyond that is definitely in it. Actually, I used 27 and 110, so let's move that up to about, about there. And on the underlying layer end of things, I wanted to take out the blending of the bright spots. And so I took that down to 102. My uh, left button down was blocking the number. I couldn't see it. Um, and then I alt clicked on it to split it apart. And I pulled this up to 155. So this is pretty close to what I used right now. Um, and then the other thing that I don't like about this, uh, once you use blending, um, what's it called, blending options, you'll get this funny icon on the right side of that layer. And if you double click it, it'll open up the blending options for you, um, just for information. The one thing that I really don't like here is what it's done to my sky. And so I'm just going to take the cheap way out of it, add a mask, uh, and paint black. Uh, let's see what my brush looks like. I'm not on my brush. Okay, I'm just going to use a soft brush and paint black to get rid of the grunge in the sky because I, I think it makes so you're it. You're masking it out, right? Yep, I'm masking it out. Um, and I, I always alt click my mask when I'm done and I take a look at it to see if I miss anything. So I'm sure I would want to mask this out. So I'm just going to do it while I'm here. And. Uh, Alt click it again to go back to the image because I know that that should have been removed. It was the parts up here. Um, so That's now that great. I now that I've got the uh, reduce the fill and reduce the flow. Okay, and then anything that I don't like in the image, I take out at this point too. I'm going to pull the flow down. The way I like to adjust my flow is to hold down the Alt button and click over flow, and that way I can pull that number down gradually however however I want. Uh, actually, it's going awfully slow. I want about 10%, though, something like that. And I don't want quite as much action over here. I don't think that that looks good. So I'm just with a very low flow, so I've got to go over and over things to get rid of them. I'm getting rid of some things that I don't like. And uh, that's good enough for me right there. Now, the colors in this image, they're they're it's too saturated right now. And I found that if I went back to Lightroom at this point and pulled down the saturation, then it just didn't do as good of a job in terms of the final result as doing it this way. So I'm going to show you the way that I did it. I added a black and white adjustment layer on top of this. And I pulled the opacity down to 70%. So what I'm doing is muting all the colors. And now when I go back into Lightroom and pull the saturation up, it's going to add the colors in in some kind of a muted type of way that I think makes it look a lot better. Um, and the final thing that I did was I added a curves layer down here just to punch things up a little bit before I, oops, that's levels, uh, just before I go back into Lightroom. Lightroom is where I'm going to make most of the adjustments to this final image at this point. But let me add a curves layer. and. Uh, from 141 to 217 was what I did. I'm just pulling this up. Where's my numbers? Are they hidden behind something? One no, it might be hidden behind the left <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, the thing that I want to do is I don't ever want to clip. I don't want the line to go solid across this part up here. So that's one thing that I want to do. Oh, there it is. 
yeah, I had to pull that down. You're right, Glenn. Uh, 141 was what I actually used as my input. And uh, 217 is my output. So I never want to pull it up high enough that it's going to make a flat line on the top or on the left side or anywhere else. I always want everything to be gradual. But as long as I don't have that flat line, I know that I'm not clipping anything. And so it's going to give me what I want and give me a good enough result to take back into Lightroom. So let's save this away now and take it back into Lightroom. By the way, it asked me, do you want to save the changes to image 2083? which was the number that I wanted it to use as my file name because that's my base. It'll, it'll show up in my catalog next to the 2083 source image. It's 99% saved. My Photoshop and Lightroom always work where it saves right away up to 99% and then it sits there for another 30 seconds before it actually goes back into Lightroom. Um, when the Photoshop icon over here goes away, we'll know that it's done. Um, there it is. And thankfully, the new version of Lightroom um, has, has that new image selected. It didn't used to be, for me at least, and I'd always used to have to hunt around for it. Um, now that's interesting. It's calling it 1909 Edit. So I've lied to you somewhere along that. I thought I was giving you a tip that was useful, but it's not. Okay, and again, I'm, I'm not worried. I'd never do this stuff on a real photo that I'm trying to keep in good, um, in good quality. But since that's not my goal here at all, I can go crazy with all this stuff, and that's what I think made the image look good. I pulled clarity up to 50. I pulled dehaze, which I had pulled up before on the original source image, up to 75. And you can see that what I'm doing is getting grunginess into the picture now. Um, I've still got the broken glass look along the bottom, so everything's still good there. I actually pulled the saturation up now to 60, and that's to make up for the black and white conversion. And I think that if you were to actually spend the time and compare these, you'd find that these colors are a lot more muted because I put it into a black and white layer, even though it was only at 70% opacity, and then pulled the colors up once I was back in Lightroom. And um, the vibrance, I actually pulled up to 20. Exposure, I increased a bit, up to uh, about 6, uh, 40, point 40. And um, contrast, I reduced. And I wanted a little bit more blue and purple, so I pulled the temperature down just a little bit to about 5 and I pulled the tint up in the purple just a little bit because I think it looks kind of cool with this image. And then uh, the last thing that I, I normally do is highlight shadows, whites, and blacks because anything else that you do to the image is going to affect those, so I like to do them last. And uh, what I did here was, I and I typically do this, is boost the shadows to bring out as much detail as I can in the shadow type areas. And then I adjust my uh, my highlights so that I have no clipping over here on the right edge of my histogram. And for this image, it takes uh, down to there. Uh, oh, that's exposure. Sorry, I hit the wrong slider. This was at 40, I believe, 0.40. Uh, so now I'm going to pull my highlights down until they're not clipped. Right there at 70 is where the clipping goes away, so that's where I'll leave it. And then the blacks, I do want to make the blacks a little bit blacker without destroying the, uh, the uh, shadows at all. And that's pretty much, that's it. Here's the one that I actually ended up with. It's not quite the same as what I've made because, you know, I was just playing with that angle that I rotated the image to and the, uh, a lot of the settings. Um, this one looks a little bit brighter, but I like it. It's good enough. It would do the job. And this, was, this was so well thought out and well put together and it was like watching an artist like a uh, paint yes. but like a modern day version it well was, this well, was great Jeff. thank you, you very much masks and it just, everything was awesome thanks i hope it was understandable and uh i've got about five more minutes that i can do showing you about 
the advantage of that non-destructive workflow, but I can do that in a few weeks if you'd prefer. It doesn't matter to me. What's the consensus? Should we go on for like five minutes or should we break it here? Keep, keep going, John. Keep going? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Now, I like this one, but I want to try some different things with it. I want to play around. And this is the way that I made the original image because I kind of liked the first result that I got, but it was nowhere near this. And so the way I play around is I'm going to go back to grid view just so that I see what I'm doing a little better. You right click on the, on the PSD file. Now you'll note that I use PSDs when I come back from Photoshop. If you come back with TIFFs, I think it probably is the same thing, but I use PSDs. Um, I'm going to right click on that and I'm going to say edit in Photoshop again. Oops, it's got to be selected. Edit in Photoshop. And now everybody's seen this dialogue and I'm not sure that you, knew, you know what to do with it. If I want my Lightroom adjustments to go back into Photoshop, then I have to use this top, uh, uh, it's not a checkbox, what is it, radio button. Uh, but that's going to flatten all the layers in my PSD file, and so I will have lost all of the work that I did. I'll only have the final result. So I never use this, never ever. Edit a copy is going to make a copy of this PSD file and put it into Photoshop. And that's what I'm going to end up using because I don't want to destroy this PSD file. Now the downside of that is that I will not have my Lightroom adjustments when I come back into Lightroom with my copy. But it's easy to get them back. I just right click this, uh, copy all of the develop settings and paste them onto the new PSD. And I'll, I'll show that whole process. Uh, and then the other one is if I just want to do a tweak into this photo and, and I don't need to keep this original around anymore, I'll use edit original and I do that probably most of the time. I only use this edit copy when I've got something that I definitely don't want to destroy. I want to try some experimentation on it and so I don't want to destroy my original image. So I'm going to hit edit here and it's going to take me into Photoshop. Okay, it already made the, uh, the edit or the, uh, the copy of it. There it is in my catalog and hopefully Photoshop is on its way coming up. Yeah, there it is. And um, on this, what I did was uh, and all I'm doing here is demonstrating the technique of, of making non-destructive changes. I'm going to disable the black and white layer. And I'm going to disable, I'm going to modify my mask, oops, my, my overlay, I mean by disabling this black and white layer. So I'm really screwing it up. Um, I'm going to change the color, the blending mode on my group to color blend. Color, color burn. And that's it. I'm going to make those changes to it. I'm going to save it, put it back into Lightroom goes up to 99% right away for me, makes no sense at all, makes a progress bar meaningless <laughs> and useless, but that's the state of it right now, at least for me. To me, that's something they've broken. And then I'm going to use different develop mode settings once this comes back, but in the meanwhile, I can take my original photo that we just made. It's not the original, it's the one that we made 10 minutes ago, and I'm going to copy all the develop settings so develop settings, copy settings, and I'm just going to select all of the develop settings and copy them to the clipboard. And once Photoshop disappears, uh, there it went. And you can see that the colors on this changed. I'm just going to paste them into here, develop settings, paste settings. And I don't know why, I think this is another bug, but I often have to do this twice, develop settings, paste settings again. Uh, and the settings are there because we can see that all the sliders are around. And uh, with this, I changed my saturation. Couldn't you sync or go back to your library? Yes, I probably could. You're right. Uh, have them both. That would be in the develop mode, wouldn't it? I can't hear what you're saying. That would be in the develop module, wouldn't it? I'd have both of them selected. No, I do the library. 
library module. You do it in the library module, okay. Go to the library. Okay, I'm working on yeah. it. I hit the G. Why isn't it going? Uh, what's going on here? G, okay. So you select them both, I assume? No, but you gotta, you gotta select them in order. You gotta select the first one has to be the one you want to transfer from. Okay. And that. then the second one where you want to transfer to. And then sync settings? And it hits sync. Yep. Okay. Oh, and then it gives you the same dialogue, that's, that's and I'll want to check all and yeah. synchronize. Yeah, synchronize, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's even easier. So let me go into the develop module now, and let me uh, um, just make a couple of quick changes here to come up with a reasonable image, and then I'll be done. I'm just showing you how you can make radical changes because you've used a non-destructive process. Um, dehaze to minus 22, I found. This is going to be a whole different look, but in my opinion, equally as good. I'd be equally happy to submit this than the one that I started with. And I'm going to reset my temperature and my tint. I'm going to pull up to 20. And it's a whole different look using whole different techniques, but it's all based on the same uh, overlays and everything. I, uh, maybe I'm not quite as happy with, with this result as what I did when I was practicing, but you get the idea. I can make those changes because I didn't do anything destructive over in Lightroom. And that includes making all of the develop module changes in Lightroom. Because if you try to make those in Photoshop using, um, what's the component called, Glenn? Uh, OK. Uh, syncing? No, not syncing. Oh. Uh, you know, over in Photoshop, you can get to all the, all the settings as well. It's called something different, though. Um, is Glenn there? Yeah, Glenn Hewitt. Yeah, I'm here. What's what's the name of of accent? I, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're asking. Okay, over in Photoshop, you can get to all of the same settings that you can do in Lightroom. What what's that thing called? Camera raw. Camera raw. Yeah, you can now, you can do camera raw, but in order to use camera raw in Photoshop, you've got to flatten the image, and so you've lost all your layers at that point. And so that's why I don't do any, any camera raw work in Photoshop unless I'm doing it to an individual layer. Uh, I always you know, save my, my composite within Photoshop and then come back to Lightroom to do all of the Lightroom type work or, or what I could have done in camera raw. But if you, might, you might try camera raw with a smart object. I've tried that and the layers are gone. You can do it somehow where you can take your whole image and save it away as, as an inner layer in the Photoshop. So all of, all of your stuff is still there, but you have to double click that layer now to make changes to it. And it just complicates things. I find it much easier to just do the Photoshop work in Photoshop and then come back to Lightroom to do the Lightroom type stuff. Just the way I work. And, uh, well, you can, you can do you can do the uh, with Shift Control Alt uh, E in order to make a, a combined layer on the top, and then go to Raw and create a smart object, and you got that. Well, that's true. You can do that, but that means you've lost all your layers and all ability to go back later on in your in your process and change no, no, the. No, 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 you haven't. I haven't. Because the, 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 the image you're working on is up on the top of all the layers. That's a smart object. Hasn't been my experience, but I'll try it. I'll try it. Okay. So that was, uh, I, I realized that I forgot to make one last change on this image that I did do during my practice, and that was adding a... Uh, graduated filter and darkening the sky to bring back the blue a little bit. Um, but that's the end of my presentation, essentially.